my name is Gay Lundestad. I am the director of the Norwegian Nobel Institute and the permanent secretary of the Norwegian Nobel Committee. And the Nobel Committee selects the Peace Prize laureates. I think I have a wonderful job. I've had many job offers, but this is perfect. I get to meet uh, almost anyone I would like to meet. I get to travel almost anywhere I like to travel. Uh, I can maintain my academic career. I'm also a professor of history at the University of uh, Oslo. I write books. And then, just to keep me entertained, uh, in my so-called free time, we invented the Nobel Peace Prize concert, so I get to meet the big stars from Hollywood and from the music world. What more can you ask for? Alfred Nobel wrote in his will uh, from 1895 that the uh, Peace Prize was to be awarded by a Norwegian uh, committee, selected by the Norwegian parliament, and it should have five members. They serve six-year terms. They may be re-elected. Uh, I'm here forever. I've been here for 21 years. So the current chairman of the committee, he is my sixth uh, chairman. So they come and go, but uh, I remember. He wrote his will in 1895 in the Swedish-Norwegian club in Paris. Uh, Sweden and Norway were in union until 1905. We had the same king and the same foreign service. And Alfred Nobel, who was very, very international, I mean, the country he lived the longest in was Russia. He lived in Paris for many years. He died in Italy. He probably saw the two countries more or less as one. And uh, he concluded that the junior partner, clearly then Norway, should have at least one prize the Peace Prize. But he also knew from his uh, friend, uh, Bertha von Suttner, uh, who uh, was uh, very close to the peace movement, and she fed him information about what was going on. He knew about the strong interest of the Norwegian uh, parliament uh, in arbitration, mediation, the peaceful solution of disputes. Uh, and the Swedish uh, parliament had no uh, similar interest. So these two facts, the Union and the Norwegian Parliament's strong interest uh, in, in peaceful solutions, probably uh, made him decide that this should be, uh, the prize should be awarded by a Norwegian uh, committee. But the committee, or the Norwegian Parliament, could of course decide to have five international members, but they, they have always uh, selected Norwegian uh, committee members. The deadline for submitting nominations is February 1st of each year. Uh, so we get uh, some nominations during the year, but the flood of nominations will come in January. So we have the first meeting at the end of February. I compiled the list of all those nominated. And the committee members can also add nominations, but they have to do this at the first meeting then, at the end of February. So this year, for instance, we had 241 uh, names of individuals and organizations. And I mean, some of them will be nominated by one or two persons, that's enough. Others will be nominated maybe by 10 or 100 or even 1,000. It goes up almost every year. So, uh, okay, the first meeting at the end of uh, February, uh, the committee members, uh, they nominate their uh, names and we draw up the first shortlist, uh, 25, 30, possibly 40 names if there are many new committee members. Um, we have some permanent Norwegian advisors and they help me write reports on those on the short list, the 25, 30 or whatever. And at the next meeting in April, I present all these reports and the uh, committee, the five committee members, will then pare down the list to maybe fewer than 10. So we go very, very quickly from 241 and down to fewer than 10. Uh, and we may have five, six meetings during the year. Uh, we bring in the international experts. Uh, and it's very important that we have some international input into this very uh, Norwegian process. I try to find out who are the leading names the top international experts and ask them to prepare reports. And we go over the same names uh, several, at several meetings. Uh, the arguments will go back and forth. And um, um, 
there should be no rush to come to a decision. So the committee will never make a decision until the final meeting. And we announced the result on the first or second Friday in October. This year it was October 7. Uh, and then we have the award ceremony on December 10, the date on which Alfred Nobel died in 1896. So December 10 is our sacred uh, date. It would, of course, have been much better, particularly when we've had problems with the laureates. I mean, they couldn't leave when they were supposed to because the airports were closed. It would have been much nicer if he had died in June, but there isn't much we can do about that. The normal situation uh, on the committee will be that three or four of the five members will support one candidate and one or two of the members will support another candidate. But the minority will have the majority candidate in second or third place and all five will agree that this is a, this is a very, very good choice. And you obviously go uh, with the majority then. Uh, the difficulty arises if the minority uh, they do not really like the majority candidate and they even want to speak out uh, against uh, the choice, then they have to leave the committee. And this has happened three times in our 110-year history. Uh, when Karl von Ossietzky, who was the opponent of Hitler, when he received uh, the prize for 1935, uh, two members left the committee, including the then foreign minister, and a previous prime minister. So the foreign minister was on the committee and this finally uh, established the separation between the government and the committee. Uh, so that was the first time. Uh, the second time was when uh, Henry Kissinger and Le Duc Toll received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1973. Uh, then again, two members left the committee. And the third time was in uh, 1994 when Arafat, Peres and Rabin received the Nobel Peace Prize, then one member left the committee. But normally it's, uh, it's a friendly situation. I mean, the members, they come from different Norwegian parties, um, but uh, we, we, try, we try to have uh, a very open discussion uh, among the members and myself. There are about 125 laureates and 20, a few more than 20 are organizations, 80 plus are males, and after this year we have 15 uh, female uh, laureates. I mean 15 is not a particularly high number, but we uh, made a jump this year and we have tried to identify good uh, women. Uh, and in a Nobel context, this is pretty impressive because the uh, Literature Prize, which is in second place, they have selected 12 female laureates. And the New Economics Prize, they have only one uh, woman. Uh, we don't feel forced, and there's, there, there are no quotas, of course, but we should be able uh, to find good women. Last year's prize to Liu Xiaobo, I mean, the Chinese dissident, was in a certain sense, the most controversial, uh, because the Chinese were so dead against the choice, and they intervened with uh, all the countries having ambassadors here uh, in Norway, trying to prevent them from attending the ceremony. So this became uh, an issue which uh, governments all over the world uh, had to deal with, so they could uh, instruct their ambassadors here whether they should be at the award ceremony or not. And the Chinese instituted their own prize, uh, I mean, to compete uh, with Nobel. Uh, so, in certain ways, this was the most uh, controversial. But I would also say that maybe also the most important. Um, and we had uh, I mean, all the leading uh, newspapers, uh, leading uh, journals came out supporting the Norwegian Nobel Committee because there was this feeling that China had been rising to such an extent that governments and businesses, they didn't want or dare to speak out about human rights in China. So we got, uh, we got a very, very sympathetic response from those who uh, are working the hardest for, for 
uh, for free press, for human rights, uh, from uh, democracy. We were flooded by protests. Uh, we, we often are uh, about the Obama choice. Uh, and most of them uh, came from conservative circles uh, in, in the US because the selection of Obama was quite popular in most parts of the world. And Obama is still seen, uh, maybe with the exception of, the, of large parts of the Muslim world, he's still seen in a very, very positive light, much more positive than in the US itself, where uh, opinions are divided. Uh, in a certain way, the choice of Obama was not very difficult, because if you, uh, if you read Alfred Nobel's will, uh, it says that uh, the prize should be awarded on the basis of the previous year's achievements. And if you asked what person had done the most for peace in the world in 2009, which was in a way Nobel's question, I think it would be very difficult to come up with a better name than uh, Obama. But I admit uh, that this is not the way in which we normally do it, uh, because it's very difficult to emphasize only the preceding year. Uh, I mean, take Jimmy Carter. We gave the prize in 2002 for Jimmy Car to Jimmy Carter, and this was obviously a, a lifetime uh, achievement. So um, we, we are not uh, uh, consistent on that point. Uh, but every now and then, we, we do phrase the question in the way Alfred Nobel did in his will. Uh, and, and clearly, uh, Obama uh, had done many things to try to change the international climate. And not all of them successful, obviously. Uh, uh, but he had been trying, um, and there were also some successes. By the way, Obama used my office when he was here. Uh, he came to uh, he came to Norway, um, and he spent uh, two days here, uh, and he met the committee. And he, but then he had certain uh, presidential business to take care of. So for 20, 30 minutes, he sat here. He he ran the U.S. from my desk. There are uh, certain categories of people who have the right to make a nomination, and the two large categories are any member of any uh, national government or national assembly um, anywhere in the world. So any member of the US Congress, for instance, can nominate. And university professors uh, in certain fields at any university anywhere in the world. So obviously there are thousands and thousands of persons in almost any country in the world who have the right to make a nomination. Most of them are not aware of this fact that they do have this right, but more and more are, so we do receive more and more letters. I do look at mail coming from uh, just ordinary people. I'm not sure you're so ordinary, but uh, you probably do not have the right to make a nomination. Uh, but I look at the mail and it's not very difficult for me uh, to introduce really, really good uh, suggestions into the process. But those without the right to make a nomination tend to nominate the same people as those who do have the right, with one very significant addition, and that is the many who nominate themselves. But if you cannot find a single uh, supporter, except yourself, um, Obviously, this is not a good nomination. I think most people who uh, write or speak about the Nobel Peace Prize uh, agree that there is one monumental uh, omission uh, on, on this list of 125 uh, laureates, and that is Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, I mean, he was the leading spokesman for nonviolence in the 20th century. Um, and he clearly uh, deserved the prize. The committee had more or less decided to give him the prize in 1948, but then he was assassinated in January. At that time, uh, the award could be received posthumously, uh, but the assassination was felt to be uh, such a huge complication uh, that the committee decided 
uh, to issue simply a statement saying that it had found no living individual worthy of the prize. I mean, a, a reference to Gandhi. But he could have received it, and of course, uh, he could have received it in 47 or 46, or possibly even before the uh, Second World War. So I think there is a pretty broad agreement, even inside the Nobel system, that uh, this, this is the big omission. Uh, and there may be some who have received the prize who uh, maybe shouldn't have, but um, even for a frank person like myself, uh, that's a bit uh, sensitive. Uh, I like my job and I int intend to stay for uh, a few more years. Uh, uh, but but this is, it, it's not so remarkable uh, that there are omissions or even some who receive the prize who maybe shouldn't have because it's very, very difficult uh, to select uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureates. What really requires an explanation is that there haven't been more omissions and more mistakes because on the whole, um, uh, while we do not claim a perfect record, we, we do claim a, a, a respectable record. And if you look in my favorite dictionary, which is right here, uh, the Oxford Dictionary of uh, Contemporary History, if you look here uh, under Nobel Peace Prize, it will say the world's most prestigious prize. That's nice. It's not me. It's a dictionary. We have established new activities like the Peace Prize concert, which is a way of reaching out through music to countries and groups we wouldn't normally be able to reach. Uh, and, and of course there, the room for improvement is uh, endless. Uh, we do uh, work through the, um, the social media and uh, uh, yes, so there, there, are, there are many ways of improving. Uh, I think what people find really remarkable about the Nobel Institute uh, and, uh, is that we, we are a small institution. Uh, for instance, the huge events which we've had now for three or four days involving thousands and thousands of people, we are only three people. The first uh, year we had a concert was in 1994. Uh, it was a small affair in the National Theatre, seating 600 people. I don't think it was televised. Uh, the prize that year went to Arafa Perez and Rabin, and they had uh, uh, no idea or I mean, we, 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 everything was done between the announcement in October uh, and uh, the December day. So it was a hastily improvised uh, concert. Uh, there was some music, but there was uh, an awful lot of poetry reading, in most of it in very awkward English, because none of them had, uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians had English as their native tongue. And uh, it was maybe appropriate that the final scene from the concert was that the final curtain hit Rabin right over the head. So um, this was not maybe not such a splendid start, but we have uh, gone from there. And now the concert is by far, by far, uh, the one program produced in Oslo and Stockholm that reaches uh, the furthest out. We have tried to upgrade uh, consistently uh, the musical presentations. And we normally have classical music, but I, we felt it would be inappropriate uh, to have kind of traditional classical music with laureates like this. Um, so we, we, we had a, a much uh, broader uh, perspective and I, I thought it worked well. So we are very pleased uh, with the ceremony. Uh, I personally thought the concert also went uh, really well. Uh, um, we didn't have the megastar. I mean, Helen Mirren is probably a megastar. Um, but we, we, we tend to have two, three, four really big names. And this year, uh, we didn't have a whole series of really big names, but I think the overall quality of the concert was very good. Uh, and I'm very, very pleased uh, with uh, the result. Uh, so, so all the big things 
it came out well. Of course, we have a long list, or I have a long list. I haven't had time to write it down yet, but I have it in my head. All the things that did not go so well, but we were, we the organizers, were probably the only ones who noticed. I've thought about this, what do all these Peace Prize laureates have in common? Uh, not so much. I mean, they are very different, and some of them are quite far out there in left field, and some of them uh, are quite conservative. But I think the two qualities uh, that most of them, probably all, uh, have in common are vision. You, you need to have a vision, uh, a clear sense of where you want to go. What do you want to accomplish in life? What do you want to do? What are the meaningful things? That's very important, vision. Uh, and the other thing uh, is courage. Uh, I mean, most of them have been working under circumstances that require quite a bit of courage. I mean, like the three laureates this year, they have all been in jail. Uh, they have all had threats against their, their, their lives. Uh, so courage and vision, I would say, are the, uh, the, the two things that virtually all of them have in common. The fact that the world is interested in the Nobel Peace Prize and that the Nobel Peace Prize can actually have um, some importance on political events anywhere in the world that's, that's, um, it's hard to believe, but it does happen occasionally. The, the Nobel Peace Prize is definitely not a magic wand. But we like to think that every now and then it can produce certain good results. That makes me happy.